What we're going to talk about here is Harari's book, Sapiens, which he has subtitled, A Brief History of Humankind. He starts by talking about uh, giving us a timeline, talking about uh, from 13.5 billion years ago when we had physics to 13 billion years ago when we had chemistry to 3.8 billion years ago when we had biology and the emergence of organisms on Earth. Six million years ago, he talk, talks about that the last common grandmother of the humans and the chimps. 2.5 million years ago was the, the genus Homo. Two million years ago, the humans spread from Africa to Eurasia. 500,000 years ago is when we saw the evolution of the Neanderthals. 3,000 years, 300,000 years ago is when we saw the daily use of fire. And then around between 300 and 200,000 years ago, or when sapiens themselves were were a, uh, evolved in East Africa, and that's kind of the, the background that that he sets the back and he then moves to seventy thousand years ago when we had a cognitive revolution and the beginning of history. And Thirty thousand years ago, Neanderthals became extinct. Thirteen thousand years ago, all the other genus of, of Homo's became extinct. Twelve thousand years ago. We had the agricultural revolution. 5,000 years ago, we had the beginning of script and money. 4,250 years ago, we had the first empire. 2,500 years ago, we had coinage of universal money. 500 years ago, we had the scientific method, scientific revolution. And about 200 years ago, we had the industrial revolution. So this is this is how his, his, his uh, book breaks down. And the, the first part is about the cognitive revolution. And we'll have, a, and that's what this video is going to be covering. The second part is about the agricultural revolution, and we'll have additional videos on that. The third part is about the uh, uh, empire, script and money, and coinage, universal money. He calls that the unification of of humankind, and we'll talk about that when we get to those. And then finally, he talks about the scientific revolution, which was 500 years ago. So what we're going to talk about now, though, is the cognitive revolution, which is from 70,000 to 12,000 years ago. An important issue in the cognitive revolution is the placement of cognition along the evolutionary line. It's very important because it demonstrates that the search for biological explanations for behavior may be incorrect. Just like we don't search for chemical explanations for all biological behavior, there's no reason why we should be using biological theories to define all cognitive behavior. So the history of Homo sapiens is the story of historical narratives, not biological imperatives. This is a very important point in, in his book because it, 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 if you think about it, it, puts a, uh, it doesn't put man as a subset of biology. Now, the cognitive revolution wasn't necessarily good news for everybody, all right? The, the, our cousins, the Neanderthals and, and the Homo erectus and some of the others, a, uh, 10,000 years ago, there were at least six species of those living on Earth. And right now, the fact that we are the only ones, it is our exclusivity that is unusual. Because if you think of dogs, there's still a whole bunch of different species of dogs, but Homo sapiens are the only species of Homo. And so because we have a small percentage of DNA from cousins, we probably are not looking at a replacement model, nor a significant interbreeding model, but a hybrid model is what he talks about. He tells us, talks, lets us know that in Europe, there's about, with Europeans, there's about a 1% to 4% Neanderthal in the DNA, and the Aboriginal in a, uh, in um, Australia have about a, about a one to six percent Denisovian DNA, but it, it but basically it means that it wasn't a total replacement, but it also means that it there wasn't significant interbreeding. Now it's one of his, his big issues is he calls it an animal of no significance, and what he wants to talk about there is that you know normally the animal that reaches the top of the food chain. Is, has developed self-confidence over time. And the ecosystem itself has basically, you know, like the, the gazelle here, has basically learned how to run faster so that as the, as the lion became the top of the food chain, the gazelle also evolved. Then you look at the next level and you have confident but anxious. Seemingly, you should be anxious because you're not at the top, I guess. 
then anxious and fearful as, as you get lower down the food chain, which is there is where we find the uh, originally Homo sapiens. However, Homo sapiens all of a sudden popped up to the top of the food chain, but they were still anxious and fearful. And that anxious and fearfulness made them dangerous and intolerant. So our, our part of our personalities that, that, that make us dangerous and intolerant is due to how fast we moved up to the top of the food chain, according to Harari. Now, suggestions for how this animal got to the top so quickly is that the brain size increased significantly. If you, the comparison, this is a, a, a comparison between a, a normal 130 pound mammal and a modern sapien. It, this is the comparative size of the brain. However, sometime around 70,000 years ago, something new happened inside the brain. And that's what is still a mystery as to exactly how and what that was. But that's what we're going to talk about a lot today. Now, was it just sapiens? Well, Erectus was around for 2.5 million years and never showed any appreciable cultural difference. The Neanderthals had a bigger brain, but never developed the complex cultures. So it appears that whatever that something new is that happened inside, it happened just inside Sapien's brain. Fire and cooking were contributing factors to this. It's interesting how he, he points out how they, how they related to it. One is he talks about how by a, uh, cooking, we freed up energy from the intestines that was then available for the brain. The, the two energy drains are the intestines and the brain. And cooking allowed us to, because we cook the food, the, we can use less energy in our intestines and therefore made more energy available for the brain. In the uh, energy drain itself, it, you know, the reason that that works is because sapiens, I mean, sapiens use 25% of their energy is used by the brain, whereas for a, a chimpanzee, it's only 8%. So to, to get that, we had to, basically, we had to be able to cook our food because we had a first thing that did is freed up time, took to eat, so it freed up where it takes a, uh, a, a chimpanzee five hours, it only takes us one hour to, to, to eat our meals. And it improved the diet. It reduced parasites and germs in the food. That's what cooking did. So fire was, by managing fire, it really uh, assisted Sapien in, a, uh, in helping grow the brain helping uh, uh, energize the brain and in, in helping us uh, uh, free up time in our day for other things that we could do. He does not talk about, Harari does not talk about the difference between being a herbivore versus being a carnivore or an omnivore. Um, I think part of that might be because he is actually a vegetarian. So uh, he, uh, he kind of just maybe left that part out. That's something that I think we might want to talk about in class. Now, an animal of no significance, the evolutionary and cultural ramifications, right? The bigger brain meant that we had to have an earlier birth. Otherwise, all the babies would die. And that then precipitated the need for education and the need for cooperation. Fire allowed sapiens to freed us from biological forces. So we were no longer slaves to the DNA and nature. So this is some of the evolutionary and cultural ramifications of the, uh, uh, of, of what he calls the animal of no significance. The next thing Harari talks about is the tree of knowledge. And he talks about basically three different types. He talks about sentences. And he talks about how for sapien sentences, we have an infinite number of them and each with a different meaning. So that's something that you don't find in any of the other species on the earth. Also, he talks about gossip, which is interesting, really. He talks about the positive value of gossip. He says gossip encourages socialization and it helped reduce cheats and freeloaders because people could talk about a, uh, and so, so if you think about it, if you want to be involved in a larger group, you have to know uh, who's the cheat and who the freeloaders are. And so gossip helps do that. So it, it helped us in, in a socialization. And then he talks about this, the number one item is myths. And it is thing about myths, myths are the secret sauce, all right? And myths and imagined realities are the figment of Sapien's collective imagination. And he talks about the fact that we now have, Sapien's had a dual reality. 
They had, there was the objective reality of rivers and trees and lions, but then Sapiens created an imagined reality of gods, nations, and corporations. Myths have made us masters of creation, not DNA. It's a very important part of, of a, uh, Harari's position. Well, the, the brain and the tools, etc., that we talked about, they're enablers, but the myths are the force that are being enabled. Some of the comparisons between the new ability and the wider consequences with regards to our secret sauce or our myths, the, the ability to transmit larger quantities of information about the world surrounding Homo sapiens, all right? What this did is a little, it, wider consequences is it provided for planning, provided for carrying out complex actions, such as avoiding lions and hunting bison. The ability to transmit larger quantities of information about sapiens social relationships. What this did is it allowed us to manage larger and more cohesive groups, numbering up to 150 individuals. The ability to transmit information about things that do not really exist, such as tribal spirits, nations, limited liability corporations, and human rights, the wider consequences of that was cooperation between very large number of strangers and rapid innovation of social behavior. The, he gives an example using the corporation Peugeot, and he talks about how the company Peugeot can manage people in a uh, in all around the world, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees can be managed and 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 can and can communicate about a particular corporation and about what they want to accomplish, uh, something that you, no other species on Earth is capable of doing. And then he wants to go back and talk about okay, what it was what was it like? Can we go back and see what it was like in the, in the early days? All right, and he talks about reconstructing the lives of hunter-gatherers from artifacts is very problematic. You know, although it's been called the Bronze Age, it was really the Wood Age, and and they uh, and they didn't really there was we don't have any artifacts from that time frame. Also, they had not domesticated animals, so that they, they weren't a uh, they weren't able to to travel and and a uh, and, and bring a lot of stuff with them. So so they they really just they packed light. <laughs> And because they packed light, uh, uh, it's not. It's very, very difficult for us to figure out what they did, how they did, and what you know, and, and things that went on. It's, there's a lot of speculation involved. Matter of fact, he, he says that the scholars' theories that we see today shed more light on the prejudice of the scholar than on the early sapiens themselves. I mean, the, the, we we can go on, as far as diet goes. We go from the, from the from one part of the spectrum to the other. The same thing with religion, the importance of it, and where it was, social structures, violence violence rates. I mean, it, it's it goes up and down the board. So that we don't really know. A, uh, what it was like for the early sapiens. Everything is really just speculation. Now, this is the flood. The flood is, is when is when they started to to, to move out and, and get outside, okay, of the just Africa, and and this is they wandered and they wandered a lot, but they wandered rather quickly. I mean, if you look at this map, you'll see that they you know I mean, in seventy thousand uh, years ago they were in. Uh, uh, in the Middle East, and then 45,000 years ago, they were in all of Europe, 60,000 they were in Asia, 45,000 they were in Australia, and 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 then in America and, and the uh, North and South America. So they were really moved very quickly all around. They told stories, they told stories. So objective realities all of a sudden got overlaid by imagined realities with their stories and they were the most destructive force the animal kingdom ever produced. An example of this is the colonization of Australia about 45,000 years ago. They got off the boat and 23 of the 24 animal species weighing over 100 pounds became extinct. He calls this the ecological serial killer. So we're kind of like the Homo sapiens Bundy. And that's kind of where he goes, that's where he stops as far as the cognitive revolution is. And so we're really heading towards, he talks about we were, it was an insignificant ape, added a big brain plus myths, took him to the top of the food chain. The agricultural revolution is all about how the hunter-gatherer morphs into a farmer, into a city builder, and into a writer and mathematician. And we'll be talking about those next.